man, <laughs> that love Jesus. Oh, Lord, I thank you, Brother Steve, and our praise team. We're, we're glad to have Harmon uh, playing the drums for us, kind of keeping Ricky and Bubba, because their fingers get going on that bass and guitar, and Lord only knows where them guys will end up, so Harmon kind of keeps them on. Hammond, 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 Hammond. change people's names. I keep telling you that because Tina is Lisa and uh, you know sometimes I forget May's name. Uh, I Listen, I've been saying hey to Judy back there and I'll forget her name so anyway uh, if I forget your names that's okay or call you something different just say no problem pastor I know. That's alright pastor Jim. It's alright. I mean <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Bubba. All right, amen. All right, I got a question. Some question for you this morning as I begin my message. And the main question is, does your soul live? Does your soul live? So I read an article this week, and it just kind of just kind of gnawed at me, you know. And it, it really basically asked a few questions that I wanted to answer for you this morning. So what do you believe about this Christian life? That was one of the questions. What do you believe? This, this magazine, Christmas for Christians, and, and, and it asks the question, what do you believe? Because you know what? Church, we've done a bad job of telling the people in this world what it is to be a Christian. We, we, we've not done a good job of that because they're still out there wondering what this whole thing is all about. What does God really want in your life? And you need to ask yourself, I need to ask myself that question often. What does God want from me? There are many in our day who have just thrown up their hands in exasperation at the Christian church. I feel that way, to be honest with you. And, and, and I've got three things that I want to share with you uh, quickly. This is all part of the introduction, so don't think I'm done. Okay? <laughs> don't, don't leave me yet, all right? So this is what many people that experience this frustration, this exasperation with the church. And, and when they go to churches, they, they found these things. So number one, confusion of faith. I've had... Lots of people, when I've witnessed with them or talked to them, that are out in the world, that are not saved, that are still lost, but they're interested in church. And they've asked me, why are there so many denominations? Why are there so many churches out there? I mean, you know, the Methodists believe this, and the Lutherans believe that, and the Baptists believe this. And, and why, if you're all serving Jesus Christ, can't you agree? And, and you know, I thought about that. that. That's a very good answer. If I was in the world and I was looking, examining, trying to find truth, find a, trying to find reality in, in religion, you know, it's, it's an honest question. The worst thing that happens, though, is there's a lot of people that sit in the views of the church that don't even agree with the church that they're going to. The other thing is, is corruption in lifestyle. There's little difference, church, in the immorality that affects the world that affects the church nowadays. The divorce rate for church people is almost no different at all than those that live in the world. And so a person in the world will say, okay, if this religion thing can't enhance my marriage, can't keep my family together, then the why? What, what answers do you have? The third thing is, is what I call combative fellowship. You know, that, that's when, when when people comes in here, and this frustrates me most of all, that, that you have churches, not here of course, you have churches out there that are constantly at war with one another. So you see the unsuspected outside church person comes in here, you know, they're considering the possibility of adding church to their lives, and, and they come into church, and the first thing they experience out in the parking lot is because somebody's blessing somebody out loud, you know. You know, I keep telling you this story because it still impressed on me that I left a church that I was pastoring out at, 
shows what a great job I was doing. Uh, walked out in the parking lot, and there was a fight, almost, physical, between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And when inquiry became as to the purpose, it was whether or not they were going to go to Burger King or McDonald's for lunch after church. <laughs> and it got loud out in the parking lot of the church. Now, what kind of testimony is that to the unchurch? Maybe you've been working on somebody for weeks and months and years, and they finally come to church with you, and then all of a sudden, boom, that happens. And you hang your head, and you say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, this usually doesn't happen. Will you come back with me another Sunday? And they say, well, you know, because it's hard to get you. And they come, hopefully it doesn't happen again. So let, let me just share with these things because, you see, folks, our lifestyle, how we live, how we talk, does reflect a life that is in Jesus Christ. When people come into this church, they ought to be able to see people that there is a difference in their life. And, and, and what do they see? You see, when, when you invite somebody to come to church, because, see, we've got a big day coming up. I know I'm pushing that this month. This is my, this is this month to push it, all right? Because we got our hundredth anniversary. It ought to be a celebration. People, you ought to be excited that Norwich Baptist Church, or you ought to be, has been around. I know there's some folks that are not, but you ought to be excited that this church has gone through the ups and downs of this life, and they've made it for 100 years. There's a lot of churches that can't say that today. That's right, Norwich. There's a lot of churches that, that can't make it past that seventh year itch. You know, because there's a lot of churches out there. You know, people say, well, why, why is it so hard to grow a church? Well, when you've got 36 Southern Baptist churches in Glen County, you can see. Because we have church rabbits. You know, we have people that will never stay at one church long. They're constantly moving. I mean, you can see them, you know. Constantly going from this church to this church to this church to this church. Mm -hmm. See, people, when they come to church, get quiet on me, scare me. <laughs> Say amen or oh me. See, that's so good. <laughs> so, but the world looks at us and they say, are these the people that have found the abundant life, that have found the fulfilled life, which is only available through Jesus Christ? Why are their lives so boring and empty and unfulfilled? Because you ought to be the people, see? The world already knows they're empty and void and unhappy and lonely and searching for something. So when they come to church, you ought to be spastic. Huh? They ought to be able to come, and in a good way, they ought to be able to come and see the joy. Why? Because you've been redeemed. You've been set free from bondage. We ought to be the most happy, liberated people there is. And they ask, lost people ask, if these people whose lives should be so great in Jesus Christ, why are they struggling? Why are they allowing worldly things to still affect their lives? If they believe that Jesus can forgive them, that sets them free, that gives them joy, peace, love, and purpose, if Jesus gives up, they ought to be the most happiest people in the whole wide world than we ought to be. You see, there's a lost and dying world, and I know you've heard that. You've heard that. So turn with me, if you will, this morning to Isaiah chapter 53, I, I mean 55. I hope you see that in the screen up there. I try to make sure it's up there. I used to put it down at the bottom, but, but John fussed at me so much. He said, Pastor, when you put your scripture down at the bottom, I can't see it. So John, see, I've moved it. If you notice over the last several months, there you go. So you'll already know where to go to. Isaiah 55 verse 3 says this. Incline your ear... And come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So outside the doors of this church is a world of desperate people. Folks, they're doomed. 
See, I, I think sometimes we're, we get blinded to this, but, but people in the world are doomed to eternal torment, tormentation, and, and they live in hopelessness. And I believe that just by our lives. You see, you don't have to carry around a massive Bible to get people's attention. But if you'll live the life, if you'll live the joy that you can find in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to go over some things this morning, I, I, I believe that we can win. We can win many to Jesus Christ. We just have to win. So, so I want to show us this morning, in Isaiah's discourse, we'll discover these few things, all right? Number one, the measure of life. Number one, the measure of life. Notice with me verse 11 and 12 of Isaiah 55. It says this. The answer is found in this, these two verses. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. Okay? It shall not return to me void, God speaking, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things whereunto I send it. So, folks, you can never go wrong by quoting scripture. Amen. You, you can never go wrong, because the Bible says his word will never return void. It will accomplish that which he intends it to accomplish. So, you, you just memorize you a couple of good old verses. You know, we've got John 3, 16. 23rd Psalms. Just memorize you some. And, and when you see the lonely, when you see the hurting, share the Word of God. You don't have to have a sermon. Share the Word of God. And then, let them see you live it. Let them see you live it. Verse 12. For ye shall go out with joy. That, that's a big I'm going to expound on that in just a moment. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. So those are important things to notice. So our text reveals four things. Number one, the measure of life includes joy. Joy. For ye shall go out with joy. The Webster's Collegiate Dictionary says this. It is an emotion evoked by well-being, success, good fortune, delight. The expression or the exhibition of such emo uh, uh, emotion, gaiety, a state of happiness, or, for, for, uh, I won't even say that word, bliss, all right? So, so joy can it be expressed in that kind of a emotional being that when we go forth, when we go, so when, when we leave this church or when we come into this church, there ought to be a certain amount of joy. We ought to be glad when they said to us, let us go into the house of the Lord. <clears throat> you ought to be happy. There ought to be a sense of joy of being able to come into the house of God. Why? Because you never know what's going to happen. Well, you know, not out in the parking lot. I'm talking about it here. Because <laughs> you never know what might come out of my mouth. Now, I know some of you might cringe a little bit from time to time, but I'm here to tell you something, that you'll never know when God has spoken to your pastor during the week, and I have written down a verse, sometimes just because I think it's going with what I'm going to say, but it may be the verse, it may be the word that God has specifically designed for you to hear, and it can help and bless your heart. Amen. Not because I spoke it, but it's because God is speaking Amen. to you. He's speaking to your heart. And if you're not here, you won't be able to receive that blessing. And because of that joy, because of that, people, once again, they come in there and they'll look at you and, and they may say, are, are, you, are you on drugs? <laughs> you know, are you, are you dipping into stuff somewhere? Because you are just too happy. Huh? You're just, and you say, no, man, I... Listen, I just read this passage of Scripture and it just blessed my heart. Or, no, I just went to church yesterday and it blessed my heart. Or, no, so I was talking to somebody and we had prayer and they began to share with me how God had touched them and that just blessed my heart. You know, so when people see you, they can see a real difference in your heart and life. Number two, the measure of life includes peace. Now, folks, that does not mean that Christians don't have bad hair days. That's not true. We, we can have them. We can have them big time. But there is a peace, folks, 
that we ought to have knowing that God is going to see us through. Now, your hair will still be the same, but God is going to see you through. The confidence is not that things don't worry us, things that don't bother us. Man, I'm bothered by a lot of stuff. I worry about a lot of stuff. My wife doesn't think I do, but I do, don't I? I worry about, but, but listen, I've learned that all the worry in the world will not change your circumstance. Rather, we ought to have peace in God. My confidence isn't in me. It isn't my ability to solve a situation or deal with it. Listen, my confidence in knowing that God's not going to put any more on me than what I can bear. Now, I've reminded him from time to time that I'm about at the pressure point. I, and, you know, I'm telling him, I say, God, I'm, I'm being squashed about all I can be squashed by this situation. But see, God knows that. And, and one thing that I've learned is when God squashes you in a situation, the next time you can't get squashed this far. You know why? Because your faith has been built up. God has strengthened you. And, and so if you see, God has a purpose and a reason. And so I can have peace, which leads me to my third thing. The measure of life includes purpose. Notice again verse 12. It says, ye shall go, go out and be led forth. You see, life, life is best experienced when we understand the purpose. God has a purpose in everything that comes by your way. God has a reason, and that reason is always for your good. That's why we can kind of quote that verse, you know, all things uh, work out for the good of them that trust in the Lord. You know, well, yeah, because God has got a purpose. He's got a reason in that circumstance that has happened in your life. So you just need to sit back and, and understand that and have peace and have joy knowing that you're in the best hands that you could ever be in your whole life. Now, when there's a lack of joy and peace in the Christian life, then you need to ask yourself, what are you doing in the kingdom? What, what, what am I doing, God? You know, I mean, it's easy to say, God bless me here and bless me here and bless me there, God, and you're not doing anything for God. You say, well, that's silly, actually. I mean, I expect more maturity out of God than that. Listen. You can pray and pray and pray. But let them. And ask God to bless you or get, ask God to solve this for you. Ask God to see you through this. But I always like to ask you, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, you want God to bless you financially. And you're still giving a quarter in the offering plate. Come on, man. Come on. I know I'm touching on a subject, Adam. Yeah. Uh, I know. I know when pastors talk about money, it makes people feel uncomfortable. Okay, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just kind of giving you the word, all right? Because the Bible says, with whatever measure that you give, whatever means that means measure that you give, that which also God will use to bless you. So are you still happy with a quarter blessing? Huh? What, what, what if you give $100? And I don't want your money, by the way. I don't, I don't, you can ask Joe, I don't dabble in the church's money. Okay? I get a salary, but you guys determine that. So I'm not going to buy an airplane. Okay? I'm not asking you to buy me a Gulfstream jet. Because I couldn't fly it anyway. I'd probably crash and burn it. Hey, there's an idea for some of you. Huh? You didn't get it. All right, now I've got to move the rabbit on because I'm chasing a rabbit. Number four, not only should we have joy, not only should we have peace, not only should we understand purpose, but the measure of life includes praise. Notice the part of the verse that says, The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Notice the praise that is being given here in Isaiah 10. Now we know that the hills and the trees can't clap their hands because they don't have one. But this is an expression that ought to be a part of the believer's life. You ought to be excited. There ought to be a certain joy in our life, folks, that our life should be filled with praise. Thank God. You can always find something where you ought to be able to thank God for it. I mean, first of all, you're alive. Amen? Thank God 
that you're alive today. Thank God that, that you were able to come to, to church this morning. That you had a vehicle. How many has been without a vehicle before? Uh, you got to always ask somebody else to take you somewhere or go somewhere. You know, when you feel about that high. And you, you know, I, I remember in high school, all my buddies were driving, you know, Mustang bosses. And Harold, they were driving Firebirds and Camaros, you know, with a 396. And yeah. <laughs> And my mom and dad bought me that Volkswagen. <laughs> That's why I'm so humble today. <laughs> I started off like being humble. Listen, you can set home all week, aimlessly living a life void of God's kingdom work, and you will have a lack of joy and happiness and peace. But it's only until you get on target, you get out there, you start praising God, you start getting involved in doing what God is. And let me let me say this another thing about worship. My Christian friend, you, you must come to understand again that worship, you've heard this before, is not something, it is not something, first of all, about you. Yes, worship will bless you. Yes, worship gives you joy. Yes, worship will give you peace. And purpose. But worship, and let me say this to you, worship is not something you discover on Sunday morning when you walk into the building. It's something that you ought to bring with you to church. Because you've already been doing it all week. You've already been praising God. You've already been thanking God for all that He's done for you. And you bring it to, listen, when you bring that to work or to church, listen, the energy the spiritual energy will be so great. Listen, everybody will get electrocuted. You know when you have that kinetic energy? You know when it's dry out and you touch somebody and <laughs> shock them? Wouldn't that be great? Touch somebody and you go, whoa, what is that? Oh, I've been worshiping all week. I'm sorry. Here, let me touch you again. Zap. All right, number two. I'm moving on. All right. You have the measure of life. Secondly, you have the meaning of life. Let me read to you verse 12 and 13 again out of the Living Bible. It says, You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills, the trees of the field, all the world around you will rejoice. Where once there were thorns, fir trees will grow. Where briars grew, the myrtle trees will spout up. This miracle will make the Lord's name very great and be an everlasting sign of God's power and love. That's, that's what life is all about, folks. Is the glory of God. I think the world in which we live in, this lifestyle that we live, it isn't always about the songs we sing or how we dress or how long church service goes. Actually, it is about God. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. If we understand the meaning of life, that is we ought to be creatures of worship and praise to God. Giving God the glory. Giving God my Christian friend, you will be on the path. If, if we can get a hold of that, if we get a hold of that principle, listen, we'll be on the path to glory and peace and joy and praise when we realize that life is not about us but it's about glorifying and magnifying the name of Jesus. And then there's the gift of God. So when we have the meaning of life, we have the glory of God, and then we have the gift of God. The last verse of Isaiah 55, it says this, And it shall be unto the Lord for a name, for an everlasting <coughs> sign that shall not be cut off. This everlasting sign speaks of the new life, the new life that we find in Jesus Christ. Folks, we ought to live this new life. We ought to live it with joy. We ought to live it with peace. We ought to live it with purpose. We ought to live it with praise. To the glory and honor of God. Number three, the means of life. The means of life. Lastly, in this message this morning, we, we must discover what the means of life is all about. How do God's people, how do God's people actually develop a soul that lives? How do God's people put this all together? Because being alive in Christ, being a Christian that glorifies God, that experiences this joy and this peace and this purpose that I'm talking about, 
How can this be realized in their life? I, I, I can hear some of you saying right now, I, I hear you, preacher. I see it in Isaiah's text. But, but you don't understand. You don't understand how I don't think this could be possible in my life, at least not for me. My, my, fi my family life is a tragedy. My finances are in ruins. My reputation is shot. It would be wonderful to experience. But, Pastor, I don't feel it's possible for me. Well, I, I want you to consider who Isaiah was writing to, if you feel that this morning. Isaiah was speaking to a people who were in the worst situation of all. They, they, they knew in their hearts that they didn't deserve anything, but they relied on one thing, and that was the love of God. Through Isaiah and in preaching, uh, Isaiah 54, 55, 56, and 57, Isaiah is speaking to them about God. He says something about God. He says that God extends grace to all. You hear me? That, that means to you. If, if you feel that your life is a shambles, if you feel that, that nothing is coming together, if you feel this morning that, that nothing is working out for you, that the walls are literally imploding around about you, I, I'm here to say something to you. God still extends grace to you. You see, Pastor, you don't know what I did. I don't care what you did. All I'm saying to you is if you'll come to God with an open heart and a loving heart and say, Father, forgive me, for I've sinned against you. Father, forgive me, for I've sinned against my family. Father, forgive me, for I've not handled things right in my finances. I've not handled things right. Father, forgive me. I'm going to tell you something. God's grace is sufficient. God's grace, His love, His forgiveness will reach down to you right now this morning and he will set you back up where you need to be. If you'll let him. If you'll let God to do that, he loves you. Now, let me give you back of the verse 6 and 7. This is what it talks about. It says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. You hear me? That's what God's saying to you today. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy. This is God's word, not just me. He will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. First John says this. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, you may think that you've gone too far. You may think that your family's gone too far. You, you may think that the church has gone too far. You, you may think that your life has gone too far. But I want to leave you with this thought. Take it home with you. Think about it. Dwell upon it. Read the Word of God. Because God's Word says... God will abundantly pardon. If you're here this morning and you need 